In the 1950s, NATO conducted an aerial survey of eastern Turkey, which included the region known anciently as Uratu, or Ararat. When the aerial photographs were examined, the specialist noticed one very unique formation on a mountainside about 12 miles south of the volcanic Mount Ararat. This strange formation was in the distinct shape of a ship. Its length was estimated at approximately 500 feet, and out of the hundreds of stereo photos taken of this region, this object was unique. Nothing like it was found anywhere else, including on Mount Ararat. When Dr. Arthur Brandenberger, World Authority on Photogrammetry at Ohio State University, saw the photo, he stated that in his opinion it had to be man-made, and it was a ship. In 1960, an expedition from the United States, including Dr. Brandenberger, went to the site. After blowing several holes in the formation with dynamite, they came away with the official conclusion that there was nothing of any archaeological interest there. However, Dr. Brandenberger continued to state that he still believed the object needed further examination. In September of 1960, an article appeared in Life magazine telling about the expedition. Twenty-seven-year-old Ron Wyatt read that article like thousands of others. But unlike others, Ron promised himself that one day he would see the strange object for himself. Ron, the father of two and soon to be three, knew it would be many years before he could ever go to Turkey. But throughout the following years, he never gave up his desire to visit the strange boat-shaped object. Ron was an avid student of ancient history, archaeology, and all of the sciences, and had never considered that the Ark could have survived until the present. But in 1960, he saw in Life magazine an object that he believed was the only likely candidate for that distinction. He had read all the eyewitness accounts of Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, and he had discovered that they were all contradictory. All were in different locations, and all were of varying sizes and shapes. He studied the history of Mount Ararat, and was convinced that nothing made of wood could have survived its past eruptions or glacial flows. There were many stories about uh, what people claimed to have seen uh, by way of remains of Noah's Ark. These ranged uh, from uh, a boat that had been broken in half and part up on the mountain, part down at the base of the mountain. Uh, but most of them implied that the boat had been caught in the ice and preserved and was nearly intact. I didn't feel that that was a uh, likelihood. Uh, and as there was no photographs or no real indication that these people had seen anything, uh, I believed that all that would be left was approximately what appeared in the picture in Life magazine in 1960. The boat-shaped object had many things in its favor. First of all, it was in the mountains, plural, of Ararat, as stated in the biblical account. Second, it was shaped like a seagoing vessel. Studying ship construction, Ron had learned that a barge-shaped vessel simply cannot survive on open stormy seas. And third, it was approximately 500 feet long, not the commonly accepted 450 feet. Ron had concluded that the author of the Genesis account of the flood, Moses, would not have stated the ark's length in Hebrew cubits. Moses was born and educated in Egypt. The Hebrew cubit came into use many years after Moses' death. The only cubit he would have known would have been the royal Egyptian cubit of 20.6 inches. This would have meant that the ark was 515 feet long, not 450. In 1975, Ron read the book, The Ark File, by Rennie Norbergen, a member of the 1960 expedition. For the first time, he now knew the names of the expedition members, and he contacted all but one of them to get directions to the strange object. However, the team had left from the small town of Dobizid on horseback, led by the military, and they could offer him no directions.
In 1977, he and his two teenage sons, Danny and Ronnie, flew to Turkey. It took several days of very uncomfortable travel to reach Dobiasit. Ron had no idea where to begin looking for the boat-shaped object. After all, it had now been 17 years since the 1960 expedition. Would anyone even remember it? And even if they did, Ron didn't speak the language and had no way to ask. So they checked into the Erzurum Hotel and got some sleep. The next day, they hired a taxi to take them to the road they had entered town on and simply began to walk. Soon they came upon a group of local villagers who looked quite intimidating. But convinced that Ron and the boys were tourists, one of the villagers appointed himself their guide. Ron saw a very large rock which had crosses carved on it. About ten feet in height, this stone had a hole on one end. Ron remembered seeing similar objects in an archaeology book that were anchor stones used on ancient ships in the Mediterranean Sea. But this one was many, many times larger. When their guide saw Ron's excitement at seeing this, he showed them several other similar stones in and around his village. Most of them had eight crosses carved on them in the Byzantine and Crusader styles. For the first time, Ron realized the possibility that the Ark had used such anchors, not for anchoring the ship, but for stabilizing it and holding the nose into the oncoming waves. The crosses on these stones were of the style of ancient Christian Byzantines and Crusaders who were well known for carving crosses on objects they associated with biblical events and places. Did these early Christians connect these stones with the eight survivors of the flood? The next day Ron and the boys again began to walk the region. This time they came upon an ancient stone house partially collapsed. Its great age could be seen by the fact that the ground level around it had been raised several feet by eroding soil from the surrounding hills. Extending out in all directions around the house was a system of stone fences also almost buried with only their tops extending above the ground. But most interesting were the two stones sitting beside the house one standing and one lying flat. These also had eight crosses carved on their faces, but the crosses were carved on top of some earlier pictographs. There was what appeared to be an arch across the top, which Ron believes was a rainbow. Below this were eight figures walking away from an ocean wave shape, above which sat a boat shape. On the stone lying on the ground, the second figure from the right was a woman. Her head was bowed and her eyes were closed. On the standing stone, both the first figure, which was a man, and the second figure, a woman, both had their eyes closed and their heads bowed. Ron drew an incredible conclusion. He believed these were possibly the tombstones marking Noah and his wife's graves. The wife, he concluded, had died first, and that is why only she was represented with her eyes closed on her stone. When Noah died, his eyes were shown as closed, as well as were his wife's. Nearby was a natural amphitheater between two hills with a large stone that appeared to be an altar. Could this possibly be Noah's post-flood home with corrals for breeding various animals, and an altar directly behind his house? These were exciting discoveries, but they still hadn't found the boat-shaped object. Finally, the last afternoon they were there, Ron left the boys reading while he made one last search. This time he had the taxi drive in a different direction, south of where they had earlier been. When the taxi had gone as far as it could, he began to walk through the mountains. After a while, he saw the boat-shaped formation directly below him. And seeing it this close, he was convinced more than ever that it needed thorough scientific investigation. 
he needed to learn what lay beneath the surface of the soil covering the strange object. That evening he and the boys paid their hotel bill and arranged for a taxi to take them back to Air's room in the morning. While packing they heard the clamor of men coming up the steps, banging on the walls and shouting. When Ron looked down the stairs and saw them, he recognized some as men they had encountered over the last three days, and he realized they planned to rob them. The region is so isolated that he knew they were in trouble if they didn't escape quickly. Barricading the door and tying sheets together, they climbed out their window onto a roof where they re-entered the hotel through its kitchen and escaped. But in the commotion, they lost most of their film and luggage. The results of that trip was that I was pretty well convinced that this boat-shaped formation was the remains of Noah's Ark and that there were several other archaeological remains out there that uh, showed this to be the area where the Ark had come to rest. And so I was quite happy uh, with that result and planned to go back at a later date and uh, do more work on the formation itself. When we returned to America, uh, I became aware that there was one other individual that had uh, not agreed with the findings of the Vanderman group. Uh, their findings, of course, or conclusion was that this was just an odd-shaped geological formation. It turns out that uh, Dr. Bill Shea that uh, worked with uh, a university in Michigan uh, had come to believe that this uh, boat-shaped formation uh, at the least represented the place where the boat had landed and perhaps had decayed away but left its imprint uh, in the mountainside out there. Dr. Shea, too, believed that the site needed to be thoroughly investigated. And when comparing the boat-shaped object to the current thought that the ark had to have landed on Mount Ararat, he wrote, To conclude, one might put these two sites in perspective by reflecting upon what would have happened had this formation been found on Ari Da, or Mount Ararat. I may be wrong, but I suspect that news of it probably would have been heralded far and wide as the discovery of the site where the ark had rested. What a difference a mountain makes! Dr. Shea had also written that he too believed that it was likely that the royal Egyptian cubit was used in giving the measurements of the ark. Assuming a mosaic authorship for these measurements probably would indicate that they were given in terms of the Egyptian cubit of 20.6 inches rather than the shorter Mesopotamian cubit. After Ron and Dr. Shea communicated and Ron shared his information from the August 1977 trip with him, Dr. Shea applied to Turkey for permission to excavate. The reply was negative. As far as Ron was concerned, there was nothing else he could do at that point, so he waited for Providence to hopefully provide opportunity. Believing it was important to have some idea of where the Ark would have landed, in 1975 Ron had performed an experiment. The uh, story of the flood indicates that the Ark was a free-floating object uh, on an earth covered with water and that it came to rest in some mountains. So with this in mind, I built a small model of uh, the boat, six to one ratio, as is mentioned about the ark. And then I constructed miniature mountains in a shallow flowing stream. And I would release the model boat upstream from these uh, little mountains. And by changing the shape and size uh, of these mountains, I was able to determine what configuration of mountain the boat would most likely come to rest in. And uh, so I found that a crescent-shaped mountain 
uh, oriented to the northeast or southeast would be the most likely place that a free-floating object would come to land. And with this in mind, uh, the site in eastern Turkey uh, fit that uh, configuration, that geological configuration, so that was a plus. Without permission to excavate, Ron felt there was nothing he could do. Then, in December of 1978, he heard about a small earthquake in eastern Turkey. On the chance that it might have damaged the boat-shaped object, he arranged to return in September of 1979. When he arrived, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. The earth surrounding the boat-shaped object had fallen away, revealing its sides, which clearly showed evenly spaced indentations along the western side. He believed these were holes, which resulted from the fractured, petrified ribs which had partially fallen away when the support of the surrounding earth was no longer present. On the eastern side, he saw what looked like portions of rib timbers which were fragmented, but still in place, only discernible due to their shape and color. The quake had caused a crack along the length of the object, and Ron was able to measure the depth of the structure and to take samples for analysis. If these specimens were decayed in petrified wood, they would contain a much higher carbon content than the surrounding area. The analysis done by Galbraith Labs did indeed show this to be the case. The specimens from the site showed 4.95 percent carbon, which indicated that it was once living matter, such as decayed or petrified wood. In addition, the analysis from the site showed a high iron content much higher than the surrounding area. A wooden ship the size of the ark would surely have had metal fittings used to hold the timbers together. The biblical account tells us that metallurgy was a known science well before the time of Noah. And the analyses gave indication that something within the object contained a high level of iron. Ron measured the site and found it to be 512 feet long, but he also found a three-foot section at the lower end which appeared to be broken away from the main section. This was extremely important because it was the length Ron and Dr. Shea were looking for. It was 300 royal Egyptian cubits in length, 515 feet. While I was there, I photographed uh, this area carefully and uh, walked on the formation for the first time. And uh, the earthquake had actually cracked the formation uh, along its entire length. Uh, and I was able to take some good clean sample material from this crack. I was also able to measure the depth of the deposit at uh, different points along the length. Anyway, I took samples along the length of the crack in the formation and from the uh, outer part of the formation, and I took samples from the countryside away from the influence of the formation so that we could have these analyzed and compare the results. The 1960 team had blown several holes in the sides of the boat-shaped object, but saw nothing that they recognized as petrified wood. Realistically speaking, it could not be expected that a 4,300-year-old ship could survive until the present. The region of Ararat experiences extremely cold winters with large amounts of snow, springtime rains, and hot summers. Exposed wood would have simply rotted away over the years. This strange boat-shaped object was now in a mud flow. It had a large section of limestone bedrock extending through its midsection, which indicated that it possibly had slid to its present location, impaling itself on this rock. Ron concluded that at some time, lava had flowed down the mountainside from the south, 
carrying the ship with it. When the ship struck the large outcropping of limestone, it was impaled and held fast. The weight of the lava piling on top of the ship collapsed the decks, and the entire ship was soon encapsulated within the hardening lava which protected it. Water from snow and rain began to accumulate underneath the hardened lava. In time, as the lava began to deteriorate, water began to flow within the decaying lava, which caused the ship to petrify. But if the ship had been covered in lava, why wasn't it burned up? Well, lava doesn't always burn everything it comes in contact with, as we read in this quote from the New LaRousse Encyclopedia of the Earth. It might be supposed that the high temperatures of the lava would give off an enormous amount of heat. This is not so, however, and it is quite usual for a flow to pass through a forest or town without causing a fire. One flow from Paracutan even piled up against oaks and cottonwoods without destroying them. How can we explain this anomaly of high lava temperatures and absence of fire and flames? To begin with, lava consists of a vitreous mass which is a poor conductor of heat. It also cools quickly at the surface, becoming covered with a crust which in some measure prevents further heat radiation from inside the mass. Thus, a lava flow has, as it were, a constantly forming, insulating case around its molten interior so that the front of the flow is preceded by a protecting crust. If the ark had been completely covered in lava, it would have been sealed, cut off from the oxygen and water which would have normally caused it to decay away. In time, the lava would begin to slowly deteriorate, allowing water to begin to flow through it and over the preserved structures of the ark. As mineralized water flowed over the wooden timbers, wood molecules began to wash away, leaving microscopic holes. As the water washed these molecules away, other molecules began to lodge in the empty holes. These were molecules of substances which the water had picked up prior to reaching the structure being petrified. The ship's structures would be literally turned to stone as its molecules were replaced one at a time by molecules from the minerals in the region above. The 1960 expedition had found no petrified wood, or at least none they recognized. They had not taken into account the fact that due to the weather extremes in the region, any petrified structure near the surface would have suffered from the effect of frost action or wedging. If this mound contained the petrified structure of Noah's Ark, the water present in the mud flow from rains and snows would have seeped into the tiny cracks and pores of the petrified and fossilized structure. This water near the surface would then freeze, expanding almost 9%, causing the petrified structures to fracture. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, When moisture seeps into the pores of a rock and freezes, it may shatter the rock into tiny fragments of silt or sand size. As this process is repeated year after year, any structure near the surface which would have been exposed to the freezing temperatures would be expected to be fragmented and in time reduced to fragments some the size of a grain of sand. It was unlikely that any petrified structure near the surface would have remained intact. At the most, these structures would have suffered enough weathering to give them the jagged appearance of old rocks. If any intact structure remained, it would most likely be found within the soil deep enough to be protected from the elements. Ron had also read about the discovery of the Sutton Hoe funeral ship burial 
which was discovered in 1939. While its treasures were what attracted the public interest, it was the actual ship that had attracted Ron's interest. The wood had completely rotted away. However, as the excavators carefully unearthed the treasures, they discovered corroded iron clinch nails still in place, as this account describes. As they continued clearing from one end, Mr. Brown was careful to see that the nails, which now began to appear in a regular pattern, remained in position. As the earth was removed bit by bit, the forward part of the ship emerged in rough outline until, moving toward the center, they cleared to the eleventh frame or rib and reached what they believed was a burial chamber. The outline of the huge ship was perfect. Every vestige of wood had rotted, but what remained was a perfect impression of the ship's hull, which had been in the sand for centuries. The earth was stained from the wood, and the rusted iron clinch nails that had once held the ship together remained exactly in place. This was very exciting to Ron, because it demonstrated that even when the wooden structure was completely rotted away, its presence could be detected by the coloration and stains left behind. But again, without permission to excavate, Ron was still at a standstill. All investigation had to be non-destructive. But the high percentages of metal in the site gave him an idea. In 1983, Ron contacted White's Electronics of Sweet Home, Oregon, and presenting the project to them, asked if they would donate metal detectors to be used in the research. His theory was that perhaps the location of the metal fittings which connected the timbers could be detected. I had contacted White Electronics uh, in Oregon and made them aware of what I wanted to do and asked them if they had some uh, metal detectors that would penetrate a little deeper into the soil than uh, the usual ones. And so they were kind enough to uh, send me their two best metal detectors. It was also in 1983 that Ron read about Colonel Jim Irwin, the astronaut, who was searching Mount Ararat for the Ark. Ron drove to Colorado Springs and met with him, explaining about the boat-shaped object. Colonel Irwin expressed interest in seeing the site, and in August of 1984, the two men flew together to Turkey. Before going to Dobizit, Colonel Irwin met with some friends in Ankara and took Ron along. At their home, Ron was introduced to several people who would soon change the course of his research. Orhan Basar and Mene Unler would become Ron's official liaisons with the Turkish government, assisting him in obtaining the necessary permits to continue his research. Arriving in Dobizit, Colonel Irwin met with his group, and Ron took several of them to the site. Orhan Bazar obtained official permission for Ron to do metal detector scans, and they scanned the entire object with the ferromagnetic metal detectors. Ron found 13 lines of consistent metal readings lengthwise along the object. Colonel Irwin, in a 1986 conversation with Ron, tells about the results of those scans. We decided that since there was some metal in those analyses that we got back from Galbraith that it might be worthwhile to uh, look at the boat with a metal detector. And so, you know, remember you expressed a desire to be there when we checked this out, and we were there. Yeah, we got some real positive readings, didn't we? Yeah. As we went up and down the, the long direction of right. the formation. And then, uh, at that moment in time, we were getting metal readings, right. but other than that they appeared at fairly uniform uh, intervals. Right. This, the spacing made it uh, appear like, uh, very much like it was you know, a man-made object. Yeah, no doubt about that. 
When they returned to the hotel and word spread, several other ark hunters wanted to see the sight. One group was headed by Marv Steffens, and when the metal detector scans were repeated, his group immediately got very excited. Ron and Orhan later spent an entire day examining the area above the boat-shaped object and visiting local villages, asking if anyone knew any stories about an ancient ship being in the region. They discovered that no one knew anything about a ship being located in the vicinity. They did learn that the village where Ron had found the anchor stones was known as the Place of the Eight, although the villagers admitted that they had no idea where the name came from. They also learned that the mountain the boat-shaped object was on was locally called a term which loosely translated to Doomsday Mountain, although again no one knew where these names came from. There is good reason why there is no record of any local traditions about the ark or a ship in the area. The original inhabitants of this region were attacked and displaced by the present inhabitants in the early years of this century. The invaders took over the lands, their homes, and even their flocks and herds. But all knowledge of any local traditions the original inhabitants may have had was lost. When Ron and Orhan scoured the countryside above the boat-shaped object, they discovered something which Ron believed was extremely important. They found a very strange section of earth approximately 120 feet long and 40 feet wide, which appeared to be outlined by a thick rim of petrified wood. Scattered over and around this section were strange-looking objects which looked like rocks, but which were very heavy and felt like metal. Ron took specimens of this strange substance. He had also taken similar specimens from the lower broken section of the site, and his theory was that it was ballast from the hull of the ark. He had earlier concluded that the ship had slid to its present location in a lava or mud flow, and he now believed that this was a portion of the hull that had remained embedded in the earth. When the ark was carried down the mountainside, it was ripped away from this portion of the hull, causing the ballast material to be left lying scattered all around. In this same area, they also found a recently constructed stone structure which had pieces of an ancient broken stele incorporated in it. Being careful not to draw the attention of the locals to these broken pieces of stone, they photographed the pictures inscribed on these stones. Pieced together, these broken pieces depicted a boat-shaped object very similar to the 1950s aerial photograph. And within this boat shape were eight faces. The very unique mountain ridge above the boat-shaped object was also depicted with ravens in flight, and next to the ridge was depicted a volcanic-looking mountain, a mountain that had since subsided. When Ron stood on the top of the ridge and looked south where this mountain was represented as being, he saw that there was a mountain in that location, but that it was no longer visible from the viewpoint of the artist of the stele. This was, Ron was sure, the volcano that had erupted many, many years ago and covered the boat with lava. Since the broken pieces of the stele were found near the location of the section he believed was the bottom of the hull embedded in the earth, he believed this stele had once marked the original location of the ark. Orhan had also arranged permission for Ron to take more substantial specimens from the boat-shaped object as well as from the surrounding terrain. On August 25, 1984, Ron left Turkey with his specimens and headed towards Athens to connect with his overseas flight. When he arrived in Athens and purchased a newspaper, he read that Marv Steffens had called a news conference in Ankara about the time Ron had left and producing a bag of his own specimens, he announced that Noah's Ark had been found. He was immediately detained, accused of taking valuable artifacts, and with this 
he proceeded to tell the authorities that Ron, too, had left taking specimens and was already out of the country. It had only been a little over four months since Ron and his two sons had been released from a three-month prison term in Saudi Arabia after being falsely accused of being Israeli spies, and he wasn't very happy at this turn of events. If the Turks believed he had taken valuable artifacts from their country, his days of working on Noah's Ark were finished. When he arrived in New York, he checked into the Carlton Hotel near the airport and called the Turkish United Nations Mission, explaining what had happened. Within a few hours, three Turkish representatives arrived at his hotel, examined his specimens, and told him that he was free to keep them. They had checked with authorities in Ankara and discovered that he really did have permission to take the specimens. He was exonerated of the charges, but only after the whole event had made the newspapers and Ted Koppel had called him a thief on Nightline. However, what looked like a disaster turned out to be the event that first caused the Turks to take an official interest in the site. The United Nations Observer and International Report featured a full-page story on Ron and the evidence at the site. What Wyatt found measures almost identically to the text offered in the sixth chapter of Genesis in the Old Testament. It was also found in the area where the Bible says the ark finally came to rest. What we actually have found is physical evidence that this is a boat. Uh, whether or not it's Noah's ark is up to the people that review the material. Uh, that's up to them to decide on that. My personal feeling is that it is Noah's ark. Wyatt admits his skeptics are severe, and he has a long road to travel before his theories can be totally tested. The rock, wood, and metal samples are currently being analyzed with reports due on the specimens by mid-September. If it is the Ark, what has been proven? To the people that believe in God, this will be a confirmation of their faith. Wyatt firmly believes ultimately his find will be proven to be that of Noah's Ark. Even then, he says, there'll be some who still won't believe it. As far as the timing of this find, he has an explanation. But I think everything is on a time schedule, and I believe that when the time is right, these things will be brought out. Back at home, Ron sent one specimen that he had taken from the section he believed was the embedded hull above the ark to Colonel Irwin, who then sent it to Los Alamos National Labs for careful analysis. Ron then went to Galbraith Labs with his new batch of specimens. These analyses were even more encouraging than the 1979 ones, as these revealed extremely high metal contents, not only of iron, but also of aluminum. Although aluminum constitutes about 8% of the Earth's crust in weight, it never occurs in the metallic form in nature. It occurs as alumina. Yet, these analyses revealed that the specimens contained both alumina and aluminum. Ron believed that the petrified structures would not only have been petrified with minerals from the soil above the site, but also with the molecules of the metal fittings of the ship which contained aluminum as well as iron. Ron arranged to return to the site a few months later in October of 1984. The Turkish government had sent several of their own scientists to examine the object, and Ron arranged to loan them one of the White's metal detectors. He wanted to see if they could duplicate the pattern of metal readings at even intervals. They did. Colonel Irwin was dedicated to searching for the Ark on Mount Ararat but he continued to offer Ron any assistance he could. When he received a call from a man who was interested in searching for the ark, but who expressed the belief that it couldn't possibly have landed on Mount Ararat, he referred this man to Ron. Early in 1985, Dave Fassel called Ron. Dave was in the marine salvage business and was familiar with several new technologies which were used in non-destructive investigations such as radar. When Ron told him about the boat-shaped object,
which he now without reservation referred to as the Ark, Dave was very interested. Ron sent him photographs and filled him in on all the data from his research, especially about the thirteen lines of metal readings which extended from one end of the ship to the other. On March 20, 1985, Ron and Dave arrived in Turkey. Meeting them there was Samaran al Materi of Saudi Arabia, who had recently visited Ron in the United States. Samaran wanted Ron to show him the mountain in Saudi Arabia that Ron believed was Mount Sinai. In December of 1983, Ron and his sons entered Saudi without a visa and went to Jabal el Laws, but were then arrested at the Jordanian border after being reported as spies. The event had caused quite a stir in Saudi, and Samaran had learned of Ron's claim after his release. Now he wanted Ron to come back to Saudi with him to show him the site, but perhaps to ensure that Ron's claims were valid, he wanted to see Noah's Ark first. When Ron and Dave arrived, Samaran was ill, and they had to delay their departure to eastern Turkey until he felt better. During this time, Mine Unler arranged for them to meet with Dr. Ekrem Arkugal, Turkey's leading archaeologist, world-renowned for his excavations of the Hittite Empire in Turkey. Familiar with both Ron's research and the reports of the Turkish scientists from the fall of 1984, Dr. Arkukal made the following statement. Uh, may I congratulate you for that great success, really? Thank you, sir. Uh, I believe it is uh, an ancient remains of, a, uh, of an old ship. This, since the earthquake pushed it up, mm -hmm. the wood you see is eroding out and it mm -hmm. must be covered quickly mm -hmm. also because we're losing much. It must be preserved, it must be, it must be preserved. These the, are the remains, oh, which yes. are at any rate remains of uh, a ship. Yes. Things had changed a great deal in the past eight months. Ron now had liaisons who made his arrangements with the proper officials and acted as translators. The government had officially taken an interest in the site, and now their leading archaeologist stated unequivocally that the object was a ship. The three men then went to the site, and immediately Dave Fassel, who certainly knew about ships, was overwhelmed by what he saw. He had brought two different types of metal detectors, a pulse induction type and the new and controversial molecular frequency generator, which, unlike the conventional metal detectors, was supposed to be able to discriminate types of metals as well as receive readings from great distances. They again were able to detect the regular pattern of metal readings both along the surface and along the sides of the ship. Ron then took them to see the anchor stones in the village as well as the old stone house and the tombstones. But when they arrived at the house, they found it reduced to rubble and the tombstones gone. Where the tombstones had once rested was now a hole partially refilled. Ron was devastated. From that point on, he was very careful not to draw attention to anything of interest for fear of it being destroyed or removed. Samaran, by now very excited, then arranged for Ron, as well as David, to go to Saudi Arabia. But before they left, Mene Unler arranged a meeting for Ron with all of the Turkish ministries involved in about two weeks, and he would formally present the results of his research and his plans for future investigations. On April 9th, they returned to Turkey from Saudi, and Ron stayed and met with the officials who listened to his evidence, and they told him that they would work with him in any way that they could. He told them about the subsurface interface radar, which would reveal any internal structure, but which was non-destructive. They assured him a permit as soon as he could arrange it. But there was a problem. The radar and its operator were very expensive. However, at this point, it had to be the next step. Soon after arriving back in the States, Ron received another call, 
this time from the scientist at Los Alamos who had done the analysis on the specimen Colonel Irwin had sent there on Ron's behalf. John Baumgardner, a geophysicist, questioned Ron about the region from which the specimen came. Ron then asked him to come see for himself an invitation which he accepted. Ron returned to Turkey for another meeting a month later in May, and then on June 2, 1985, John Baumgardner accompanied Ron and Dave Fassel to Turkey. Using all three types of metal detectors, they scanned the site, placing rocks and markers at every place they got a reading. They then connected these rocks with ribbons, revealing the pattern of a massive ship. Dave found a specimen which John examined and found to be consistent with hand-wrought iron. My oh. name is John Baumgartner from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I've had the privilege of being on this expedition with Ron Wyatt and David Fasol this last week to the site east of Do Dobizit in eastern Turkey, uh, investigating the uh, site of a large boat-shaped object. Okay, would you uh, show us briefly this uh, specimen that uh, <clears throat> Mr. Fossil uh, owns and that we wish we owned? Okay. It's uh, striking in the fact of its angular character. Have uh, so it seems to have some preferred planes in the object on the outside as well as the inside. This inner portion that appears to be a silica replacement of something. Uh, this would represent, if the interpretation is correct, a portion of an angle bracket. And we, we see a corner of it here. It's uh, interesting that it uh, apparently still displays the, the uh, grain structure of the iron. Now, and does it, this seem to be cast iron or wrought iron? I would or? say it's it's uh, has the character of wrought iron, and uh, uh, it appears that this is almost pure iron oxide here, this outer portion. All right, from uh, your <coughs> own use of metal detecting equipment out on the site, John, would you say that this is an isolated piece of uh, iron? No, we found uh, just an incredible amount of iron in this in this formation. Uh, this is one of, uh, this was sampled from one of the many points along the store, uh, we were on the starboard side where we collected this, this uh, sample. Uh, they, they appear to be uh, regularly spaced along the, uh, along the boat. But Ron knew the difficulty they would have in convincing anyone else that this object contained the fossilized remains of a massive ship. The general public simply didn't understand about petrification and frost wedging which fractured petrified wood. Even more importantly, Ron was discovering that many trained geologists didn't recognize pre-flood petrified wood because it doesn't contain the growth rings of post-flood wood. None of the specimens he had taken from the site had growth rings, and because they were fractured from the weathering, they were only fragments of timbers unrecognizable as wood to most people. There were no growth rings because the biblical account states that there was no rain prior to the flood but that a mist watered the face of the earth. Growth rings result when the growth of the tree halts due to cessation of its water supply during the cooler season or during a drought. Scientists who reject the biblical account even agree that carboniferous plants contain no growth rings, but this would be a stumbling block to many. On the western side, the rib timbers had been exposed to weathering and had fragmented and were rapidly falling away, leaving only the empty spaces where they had once been. The only way to distinguish the rib timbers on the side that still retained portions of them was from the color difference in the fragmented ribs from the soil surrounding them. The exposed ribs were, for the most part, 
now reduced to very small fragments, but they still remained in place. By this time, Ron was convinced that this was indeed Noah's Ark, and this ship, as such, is the oldest man-made structure on earth, and it is in the exact condition that was to be expected, but it wasn't what the world wanted to see. They were looking for a barge-shaped ship, still intact or perhaps broken in half, but still wooden, not petrified. And they were looking for it on Mount Ararat, even though this volcano had experienced several eruptions, the most recent in the mid-1800s, which was very similar to the Mount St. Helens eruption, which blew out an entire portion of the mountain. Uh, the uh, upshoot of the uh, interest of the group at Los Alamos is that Dr. Baumgartner uh, made an appointment with myself and uh, we uh, and David Fassold uh, to meet some people out in Dallas that were considering funding part of the documentation on this formation and uh, David uh, suggested that a subsurface interface radar scan of the site would be helpful and useful since we were denied permissions to excavate and uh, of course this uh, I was very happy with that prospect and the results of our meeting in Dallas was that the project to do a radar scan uh, of the site was funded Everyone's hopes were riding on the radar scans. Only the internal structure could have survived the weathering which was fragmenting everything on and near the surface. Dave also arranged for ABC's 2020 to cover the event. On August 1, 1985, Ron arrived with the permit and was joined by John and his group, which included other scientists from Los Alamos. They went directly to the site and repeated the metal detector scans, again laying out the pattern of ribbons. The Los Alamos scientists also measured the site with sophisticated surveying methods and confirmed that it was 515 feet and 7 inches. Dave would arrive a little later with the radar and its operator, Tom Finner of GSSI. 2020 was also on their way. But with all the attention the outsiders were receiving, the local guerrillas took this opportunity to make trouble. Commandos were assigned to protect the men at the site, and they positioned themselves in the crevasses around the ship. But suddenly shots rang out, and the commandos quickly rose up and fired upon the terrorists, sending them fleeing, but not before killing several. Martial law was declared, and by the time Dave, the radar, and 2020 arrived, the site was off limits. It was a terrible disappointment, and everyone's frustration was intense. But the coverage by 2020 documented the metal detector scans and other evidences, making the public aware for the first time of what was happening on Doomsday Mountain. Do you believe Noah's Ark actually existed? Could the legend that sounds like a fairy tale really become proven fact? Well, the search has been going on since biblical times. And in a moment, you're going to meet some people who are positive they have found the Ark. Now, we know such claims have been made before. But a few months ago, these people came to 2020 with some new and intriguing scientific findings. The boat-shaped site was first found and photographed by a Turkish army captain back in 1959. It was quickly explored and dismissed as a freak of nature. But Wyatt, an amateur archaeologist, rekindled interest in it a few years ago. He brought in Dave Fassel, a marine salvage expert, to assess it. Fassel felt he knew a shipwreck when he saw one. He became obsessed with it. For over a year, I haven't dreamed about anything else, from the time I put my head on the pillow to the time I wake up. And that's all I think about all day long. And I'm sure that's all Ron thinks about. <laughs> The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors. 
and has been used by Fassel to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape, outlined by the ribbons, was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. The fascinating field of ribbons soon attracted higher academic interest. That looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical ark. To resolve this final issue, Wyatt and Fassel brought geologist Tom Finner to Turkey with his company's heavy-duty subsurface radar equipment. Gear like this located the black box cockpit recorder on the floor of the frozen Potomac River after the Air Florida crash. Suppose this rock were a foot or two feet underground. Would it give you a reading as to where that was? Could you locate it? Yes, we could. Is it possible that there will be a moment at which you will say, this is a man-made object? Uh, the symmetry of the feature suggests it's about, um, I hope to prove that the underground structure is in fact that of a boat. Just before we arrived to do this story, several groups of climbers, including ARC hunters from the Probe Ministries of Texas, were attacked high on Mount Ararat by a band of Kurdish separatists. They sent in several battalions of elite commandos who swept up Mount Ararat chasing the rebellious Kurds with predictable results. Some were killed, some arrested, but others escaped southward toward, you guessed it, the boat-shaped site on Doomsday Mountain. It became a hornet's nest of anti-guerrilla activity. The restrictions of martial law left the American explorers isolated from the outside world, not even a telephone. Well, I'll be back next year. You sure? Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna hang in like smell on a skunk till there's nothing left. Hang in like the smell on a skunk. The Turkish government stopped the exploration. What now? Since we were there, Barbara, things have cooled down, and they've sent their own team of scientists in to take a look at this site. It's a very fascinating location. John Baumgartner did a live interview with CBN during the event and this too brought the site to public notice. John explained that the site was completely unique. Not only had they performed metal detector scans on the site, but they had also examined other sites which, at first glance, appeared similar, but which showed absolutely no metal readings. Do you suspect that the formation itself could be different than any other formation on the mountain? Uh, we feel the, the formation is quite unique. Uh, there are several uh, formations that have a superficially similar uh, shape, but uh, and we've investigated several of them, and uh, they, as, as we investigate them, we find they are uh, do not have the special characteristics we find in in the in the uh, site we've been focusing on. But still. The radar had not taken place. Back at home, Ron approached a Tennessee businessman he had worked for many years earlier, whom he knew had funded worthy projects in the past, with the request that he assist with the radar equipment. This gentleman, who asked to remain anonymous, told Ron he would purchase a radar system. His business would retain ownership but he told Ron he could use it any time he wished. He purchased the SIR-3, a system similar to the SIR-8 that had been brought to Turkey in August. It was shipped directly to Ron's home in Madison, Tennessee, and upon its arrival, he immediately took it to the customs office and registered it, placing the customs declarations in both the radar case and the bag which contained the cables and small antenna. It was too late to do a scan in 1985, but he wanted to be ready. He wrote his name and address on the card and placed it in the glassine window on the bag. He was ready. Then he took it to the owner's office as they wanted to use it on one of their construction projects.
He returned again to Turkey in October of 85 and again in May of 86 before returning in June of 86 with Dave. So here was the radar and here were Ron and Dave and Dave was already a certified radar worked for many years earlier whom he knew had funded worthy projects in the past with the request that he assist with the radar equipment. This gentleman who asked to remain anonymous told Ron he would purchase a radar system. His business would retain ownership, but he told Ron he could use it any time he wished. He purchased the SIR-3, a system similar to the SIR-8 that had been brought to Turkey in August. It was shipped directly to Ron's home in Madison, Tennessee, and upon its arrival he immediately took it to the customs office and registered it placing the customs declarations in both the radar case and the bag which contained the cables and small antenna. It was too late to do a scan in 1985, but he wanted to be ready. He wrote his name and address on the card and placed it in the glassine window on the bag. He was ready. Then he took it to the owner's office as they wanted to use it on one of their construction projects. He returned again to Turkey in October of 85 and again in May of 86 before returning in June of 86 with Dave. So here was the radar and here were Ron and Dave and Dave was already a certified radar operator having completed the course at GSSI. They immediately took it to the site and did 10 passes. <laughs> Okay, go. Now we're going across the front end of the boat, and David set those markers in so he can see if there's a relationship between the metal lines of his frequency generator and the parallel uniformly separated timbers that are showing up on the SIR. Boom, 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 look at that. There's the wall. Okay. Oh, you need to get a little farther distant oh, from yeah. it, Dave. Well, can, uh, okay, that's got it right there. Point, yeah. Right? Yeah, this point. All right, let me show you what we're doing. Uh, this is the upper end of the of the boat. Uh, I've just located the uh, the very end of it again. Uh -huh. The green stakes represent bulkhead number two. All right. All right. Uh, that's at 63 feet. Yeah. That, those stakes are actually at 66 feet. All right. Okay, now, I, I, but I'm picking up the, where, the, where the, uh, the longitudinal bulkheads double up at the bulkheads. Right. That's why I've got so many stakes that are green. Right. But then when I go in between bulkhead two and three, uh, I haven't got as many bulkheads. Right. You see what I mean? Because they haven't doubled as up. As many longitudinals. Yeah, right. I haven't doubled up. Okay. These are coming out real good. Yep. And uh, if you want to bring the camera over, I want to show you how it's, uh, it should come out on the paper. All right? Just... Okay, we're going to walk over. Yeah. Take a look. Leave it, leave it running so everybody knows that we're not cheating here, right? <laughs> you got it. Cool. Okay. Now, this is the west, the west bulkhead. Okay, can you look through there and... All right. This is the west bulkhead. All right. That was over there. And he walked easterly. Here we start getting the longitudinal bulkheads. Here, 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 here. Okay. Here. You see there how it shows up? Right. So, I mean, that stake is not a figment of my imagination, nor with the frequency generator. Right. This, uh, this uh, subsurface radar shows that there's, there is something underneath there. Ron then called John Baumgartner and Dr. Bill Shea to come and participate in the event they had all waited for. Ron got all the permits needed, and soon they were all on their way. John's group arrived and had brought a hot air balloon to use to film the sight from the air. Dr. Shea was on his way. 
but before he arrived, disaster struck again. John's group had inflated the balloon in the hotel parking lot, and it caught on fire, causing such a commotion that their permits were rescinded. When Dr. Shea arrived, the sight was off limits. He didn't get to see the object of his study for so many years, but Ron did take him to the village and to several of the anchor stones. It looks like it has one, two, three, four, five, and five, and one, two, three, four. This one's got fourteen. Undoubtedly, uh, well, here's the central cross that they're going by, of course. And it's difficult to tell which were the originals and which are the extra ones that have been added later. But here you have five, a little one here, uh, three more here, and here. And then this one matches with this one. There's more here. So we have five down here, five up here, and four over here. So the extras were undoubtedly added uh, at a later time, and you can see there's also been some damage in terms of, uh, of target practice. Right. Now this gives you a nice idea of the height of some of these stones, and it also gives you a nice idea of the location of the, of the uh, hole at the top of the rock. This rock also has the crosses carved in it. They're a little harder to see because of the ridges in the rock, and the natural ridges in the rock. But if you look carefully, uh, there are a number of places. Here is a good example. <coughs> Here is another example, rather. And uh, here is the bottom of the bigger one. The bigger cross comes across here. Uh, so probably if you could examine it more carefully under changing lighting, you would see all of them. And uh, undoubtedly, this stone probably was also standing up. And uh, you'll notice that the distribution of the crosses seems to be lower in the rock down to the, uh, the bottom part of where it would have stood upright. The June 1986 expedition was the last time Dave, John, and Ron would work together. But it certainly wasn't the end by any means. Returning home, Ron took the video of the radar scan along with the printouts to GSSI, the radar manufacturer, and he showed it to both Tom Finner, who had come to Turkey in August of 85, and to Joe Rosetta, vice president of the firm. They confirmed the results. The scans showed man-made structure within the formation. Indeed, there is something beneath that rock besides rock. A radar device developed by Geophysical Survey Systems in Hudson was used on the mountain. The device called SIR is used by energy exploration companies to analyze what's below the Earth's surface. According to SIR, Something man-made is under Mount Aridog. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random na natural type interfaces. Okay, we are at uh, Geophysical Survey Systems Incorporated in Hudson, New Hampshire. And in front of you here, you see uh, some of the SIRs equipment, subsurface interface radar equipment. And these are other varieties of the same system that we used out in eastern Turkey. Evidence, evidence I was hoping to come up with when I was up here last year. 
At that time, Ron completed his training on the radar equipment and received his certificate. On November 8th, he returned to the site and did complete scans of the entire ship as well as the surrounding area, reporting the results to officials in Ankara. In December, the decision was officially made. The evidence was complete, and Turkish scientists agreed with Ron. It was the remains of Noah's Ark, officially. The evidence had been scientifically studied. Years earlier, the photogrammetry expert, Dr. Arthur Brandenburger, said the boat-shaped object was man-made based on his years of experience in studying stereo photos. Chemical analysis of specimens taken from the site showed the presence of metals in quantities and types that do not occur in nature. They contained organic carbon, which proved that they were once living matter. Natural rocks do not contain organic carbon. The metal detector scans showed a very distinct, organized pattern of metal beneath the surface consistent with the shape of a ship. These scans were done numerous times using three separate types of metal detectors, all of which confirmed the same results. Laser and other sophisticated methods of measuring performed by scientists at Los Alamos confirmed the length measurement. They showed the object to be exactly 300 royal Egyptian cubits. The subsurface interface radar scans revealed visual evidence of organized structure encapsulated within the boat shape structures that were positively identified by the radar specialists as being man-made. Turkish authorities, many of them of the Muslim faith, who accept the flood account of the Bible, saw no other conclusion possible. It was a ship. It was in the mountains of Ararat. It was 300 royal Egyptian cubits in length. It was the remains of Noah's Ark. In February of 1987, Ron was asked to appear on Turkish radio and television and discuss the research. And then in 1984, we came out and uh, we found that there was some metal in the boat, which was kind of a surprise. But in Moses' record that he wrote in the Torah, which the Quran, of course, says the Torah right. is reliable, and uh, in there... Uh, the story tells us that they had metal. Now, Tublacane, who was the great, great grandson of Adam, our fourth generation, used iron and bronze, which meant they knew about alloys, alloy process. So the flood happened in the tenth generation. So uh, it appeared that they had metal, and it's logical that uh, Noah would ship. use it, yes. And so once we found that there was metal in there, then we got a special metal detector and took this over the ship. Mm -hmm. And by this method, we could find where there was metal in the ship. And it turns out that on all of the rib timbers, there's metal brackets, and on all the timbers that run lengthwise of the boat, there's metal, uh, metal brackets. So we were able to document where the timbers were just by reading the location of the metal from the surface without digging any. He then met with the governor of Ari, the district which contained the ark, and arrangements were made for the official dedication ceremony to be held in June 1987. <laughs> Ağrı'nın e, Ağrı hakkında ve tarihi hakkında bilgileri kapsayan bir kitabımız. Çok teşekkür ederim. Kitabımız size takdim etmekten şeref duyuyorum. He returned in both April and May of that year, again scanning the site with radar. By adjusting the frequency of the signal and scanning the same location over and over, 
Ron was able to obtain data that would produce a three-dimensional image of the structure beneath the surface, allowing him to construct a model of the ship. On June 20, 1987, Ron was guest of honor at the ceremony held on a hill just above the Ark. In attendance were officials from Ankara and the regional governmental agencies, high-ranking military officials, scientists from Ataturk University who had independently investigated the site, and numerous journalists. Plans were also revealed for a visitor center to be built overlooking the Ark, and it was dedicated as Noah's Ark National Park. Ayrıca Nuh'un gemisi olayıyla ilgili yapılan çalışmaları iki gün önce Ankara'da üzerinde duruldu. Bu üç tekliften birisi de e, burada teklif sahibi Mr. White var. Bu konuda büyük emeği geçmiş. Ben e, Mr. White yanında diğer e, araştırmacılara huzurlarınızda teşekkür etmek istiyorum. The governor then asked Ron to bring the radar to the ARC site and perform a scan for the officials and journalists. After doing several passes, Ron explained the printout to those in attendance and pointed out what he said he thought looked like an intact timber just two feet below the surface. The governor ordered a soldier to dig, and what emerged was this section of petrified timber. The event was shown on Turkish television throughout the country. The governor gave the timber to Ron to bring to the United States to be tested. Everything that the Turkish scientists had recovered to that point had been kept under wraps. The governor wanted this to be made known, and placing it in the radar case, it arrived in the States in perfect condition. Back home, Ron took the precious timber to Galbraith Labs. It was an incredible specimen, perfectly intact, and displaying evidence that it was hand-hewn and laminated. Three separate layers of wood could be seen, but more exciting was the fact that the laminating glue substance could be seen to have oozed out on one end and was perfectly preserved in the petrified specimen. At Galbraith, they carefully chiseled off a sample. If this was truly petrified wood, it would contain organic carbon. If it were just a rock, it wouldn't. First, a test would be run for total carbon, both organic and inorganic. Then, a test would be run for inorganic carbon. By subtracting the amount of inorganic carbon from total carbon, the amount of organic carbon would be determined. We're in the process of weighing the sample now for the analysis for the total carbon of this sample. The inorganic carbon will be included in this determination, all the carbon that's present. As we run the inorganic carbon, we'll be able to tell the difference if there's any organic present in the material. We're getting 0.71% full of carbon in this. Zero. Point seven one. Yes. Present time we weigh about five hundred milligrams of sample for a carbonate determination. That would be the inorganic carbon in the sample. Right. So we subtract that from the total carbon and that tells us what 
percentage is raw carbon and what is uh, is the carbonate. But we tell you what percent of organic carbon that you would have there. Left. Uh, okay. 81 ppm in organic carbon. Okay. Thank you very much. Of the 0.71% total carbon, 0.7019% of it was organic. And not only did it contain organic carbon, it contained 13% iron, iron from the metal fittings. When this timber was petrified, the water washing away its molecules immediately washed in iron molecules from the metal objects it had already passed over, which filled the empty holes. Ron again arrived in Turkey with the SIR-3 radar on July 23, 1987. He again continued with his scans of the entire arc, setting the frequencies to reflect the structure at varying depths. He now had all the data he needed. The width of the arc was 138 feet at its widest point, which was wider than 50 royal Egyptian cubits, which equals 87 and a half feet. But the decks could be seen to be collapsed, and when they fell, this broke the deck joist, which held the ribs in position. This caused the ribs to fall outward, giving the initial appearance that the ship was wider than the biblical measurement. But the internal structure, showing bulkheads, were the proper width. The radar showed a tremendous amount of damage to the ark, but some chambers could still be distinguished. Ron assumed symmetry when he built his model. If a section was in poor shape on the left side, but was in good shape on the right, he constructed both sides identically. On the southwest side near the front, the radar showed a very large door which opened to a ramp system which led to the different levels of the ship. The top and middle decks appeared to be completely open along their midsections, which possibly would have allowed light from above to penetrate through the entire ship. The top deck could not be reconstructed with much accuracy due simply to the fact that it was collapsed almost completely. All that could be determined was where each level began and ended. The four keelsons, two of which extended along each side of the ship, continued to extend out beyond the rear of the ship, a feature Ron has never seen before. When Dave had used his molecular frequency generator on the ark in 1985, he had noted a large section of the hull which showed a void. When Ron and Orhan Bazer found the large section above the ark, Ron believed this was the bottom portion of the hull that was embedded in the earth and which remained in the earth when the ark was swept down the mountain. Now the radar showed this same void. Since 1977, Ron had seen numerous anchor stones. In 1977, he saw one above the present location of the ark. He later found one approximately one-half mile below the ark, while the largest number of them were located about 15 miles away in the village known as the Place of the Eight. Any determination of exactly how they were used on the ship would be conjecture, but it appears that they were dropped or cut loose when the ark entered the area. In an attempt to discredit these stones, alternate theories have been proposed as to their origin. One of these theories proposes that they are Armenian cult stones that originally had cult symbols carved on them, and that the holes at the top were for candles or represented the pagan eye of the dragon. This theory proposes that when the Armenians converted to Christianity, they erased the original inscriptions and replaced them with crosses. But in 1989, Ron found two more anchor stones, 
only these were buried in the earth and were only now beginning to be exposed due to soil erosion, and they contained no crosses or inscriptions of any kind. If these were truly anchor stones, it makes sense that some would have been buried in the mud after the flood, and the Byzantines and Crusaders couldn't carve their crosses on them. But if the Armenians had made them, where were their cult inscriptions? Ron, what's the significance of the placement of the crosses in these stones? All right, uh, Tom, this is an iconographic representation here of a man, the head of the household, his wife, his three sons, and his three daughters or daughters-in-law. And as you can see here, the eight crosses, the ones to his left are the lady folks in the family. The ones to his right are the men folks in the family. Do these fit the, uh, the story of Noah? Uh, they do. Another interesting object sets alongside the road leading to the village of eight. It is a very large section of what appears to be petrified tree bark, and it too has eight crosses carved on it. Ron has theorized that it may have been part of the covering of the ark that Noah threw off after the dove and olive branch scenario. Bark is well known for its watertight properties and again, someone many years ago associated this object with eight. In 1988, work began on the visitor center, as well as construction on the highway which led to the turnoff up the mountainside to the ark. But the world was not overwhelmed by the discovery of Noah's ark. In fact, it received very little media attention in the States, and when it did, the traditional ark hunters came out in force to deny its reality. Various theories had been developed since 1984 as to what the boat-shaped object really was. Some of these theories were that it was a syncline or a geological formation described as a clay upswelling in a lava flow, which John Baumgartner discussed in 1985. It had been proposed that this was a natural formation resulting from a mud flow around some kind of volcanic plug. Uh, first of all, the, the rock formation here in the center of the ship is not volcanic, uh, and it much, has much smaller extent than the, than the ship itself, and it appears to, from these uh, lines that you've been drawing that the ship has impaled itself upon it. Uh, there's no evidence for any kind of plug beneath this thing. There's uh, erosion all the way around it, and, and there's no, no sign of, of such a uh, uh, firm formation that could, uh, could produce this, this oval-shaped object. So it's not a clay upswelling in a lava flow? No, no. Another theory? was that it was a copy of the ark built by Constantine, another theory which failed simply because the metals found in the ark were not in use at that time. Aluminum has only been alloyed since 1948 and titanium since 1936. Then there is the theory that it is an ancient fortress. However, it doesn't take a great deal of intelligence to recognize that no one in their right mind would have built a fortress in a mountain valley surrounded by hills. Their enemies would only have to stand upon the surrounding hills and shoot down upon them like sitting ducks. The strange metal objects Ron and Orhan found above the ark site, which Colonel Irwin sent to Los Alamos, were very important. They proved to contain an extremely high content of manganese dioxide, titanium, and aluminum. This material was identical to some of the specimens Ron had found falling out from the lower end of the hull, and he therefore concluded that this material was used as ballast. Ballast is any heavy material placed and secured in the lower hull of a ship to give it stability. All ships have ballast, and Noah's Ark would have been no exception. But because of the exotic combination of metals contained in these masses, the evidence indicated that perhaps as the ship was constructed, 
the slag or waste product of the metal production of the ship's fittings was placed in the hull as ballast. John Baumgartner had contacted Ron after examining the specimens Colonel Irwin had sent to Los Alamos, and it was this specimen that first attracted his interest. Uh, in 1979, uh, I found uh, that the group in 1960 had blown away a portion of the hull, and uh, at this point, some of the ballast in the boat uh, was exposed, uh, and at the surface, I broke off a small portion of this and brought it back for analysis, and the analysis showed that it was 84 percent manganese. Now, this is a rather sophisticated space-age metal, and uh, these analyses get to be rather expensive very quickly, and when you get an unexpected analysis, uh, the uh, thing to do is to have other labs do a check on the same material to see if they get the same results. We couldn't afford that, but Jim Irwin, when I showed him the analysis, expressed an interest in getting it checked, so I gave him a part of this ballast, which he uh, sent to Los Alamos National Laboratories, and uh, he said that he would, wanted to do that, and it was fine by me. They got the identical results, so I received a phone call from uh, Dr. John Baumgartner, uh, quizzing me about the site, the location uh, of the object in the area, and uh, I could tell that he was trying to uh, figure out something from my description of the area, so I invited him to come along, and he agreed to do so and brought two other individuals from Los Alamos with him. Uh, and I found out later that uh, they had concluded because of the nature of the analysis that a uh, part of a satellite or uh, a missile had come in out there and uh, so that uh, uh, did help our investigative procedure considerably. One critic took it upon himself to declare that these specimens were manganese nodules which are found by the billions of tons on the Pacific Ocean floor. However, Ron's specimens weren't taken from the Pacific Ocean floor, nor did they compare in composition or size with these manganese nodules. Manganese nodules average about 35 percent manganese dioxide, and they also include copper and nickel. The ARC specimens contained no nickel or copper, but they do contain titanium and aluminum. In fact, the ARC specimens contain exactly what would be expected in waste product of high-tech metal alloys. In 1990, Ron, Marv and Renetta Wilson of Dallas, Texas, Tom Allen of Switzerland, and myself decided to spend some time examining the house Ron believed was Noah's. The ancient stone fences could still be easily seen extending out in all directions from the house, only their tops extending above the earth. But another interesting feature was the large rock behind the house that looked like an altar. So we all hiked up to it and found not only the large rock, but a complex of rocks that clearly had been arranged by humans for some purpose. We're standing up here next to the uh, altar stone. We're to the right, looking down into Kazan. You can see the lay of the fencing as we pan. Digging out here, too, right? <coughs> Everywhere. These stones up here have obviously been placed in this manner 
They're quite large. In fact, they're extremely large. As you can tell by the deal of ours standing there. Could easily put, say, the sacrificial animals in here, Ron? Probably. Now, we're in the little area. There was a doorway. Here we are in another pinned in area. As we pan over here is the very large stone that we suspect would be the altar. When we climbed upon the hill around the large rock, we discovered it to have excellent acoustics like a large amphitheater. Okay, I'm standing up on the stone now. It was quite a big step. Of course, there's a lot of moss on it, and we look out straight dead ahead at Noah's house, and then just beyond there, Kazan. Right over here, the pen, possibly where the animal was brought to be prepared, the little place Here you go. where its blood was shed and drained. And Ron says that he can hear me quite well just talking in a normal voice here. Renetta and I measured the altar as we now refer to it and found it to be an extremely weathered 12-foot cube with a step in the back which was about three feet above the ground. Standing upon this step and looking over the altar, we had a magnificent view of the entire region. The house and its system of fences was directly below. The rocks on the side were arranged in a manner that was consistent with being pens for medium-sized animals. There were also two large rocks which seemed to have been shaped. Okay. okay, this is designed to kill and bleed bullocks, or large cattle is the term used in the Bible. They bring them up this ramp here and they chipped this out <coughs> and also chipped out here so the animal could be led and somebody behind swatting it appropriately would get right up here. And then they could turn it around and then bind its feet and legs, of course, and lay it down with the head down this way and cut its throat. And, of course, the blood would all run out. And Noah was specifically instructed that they should not eat the blood of the animal. And, of course, there were other parts, too. All the rocks had suffered a tremendous amount of weathering, but it was quite evident that many had been arranged by humans. However, it would have taken a large number of very strong men to have moved some of these boulders. One was leaning against the cliff face in a manner which formed a roof, and it was so large that I could walk under it without stooping. I don't think there's any chance that uh, anybody around here moved this rock here. That rock is gigantic.
Ron believes this was Noah's altar, where his family met during the times of their sacrifices. We then walked down to the house and spent a long time examining the area. We found no evidence that the area had been inhabited for a great number of years. Okay, we're looking at Noah's house here. I'm trying to be very um, discreet, as one of the villagers is, come up here next to us. We're looking at the fencing now. You can see how it went across the hill, up high also, and even all along the top. Okay, now we're surveying the fencing from the other way. It's pretty bright. I'm trying to shade it. Here we can see the fencing that ran up beside the house. This gives us a real good view of the fencing right behind it. In 1990, Ron conceived an idea which he thought might help demonstrate the condition of the ship. The western side had suffered a tremendous amount of deterioration and weathering. The exposed ribs were virtually gone, leaving only the indentations in the soil surrounding them. But the eastern side contained a section which appeared to still contain some of the petrified although severely fragmented rib timbers still in place. In October of 1990, Ron and Richard Reeves went to the ark and took shovels whose blades they bent and sharpened like giant razors. Scraping just a few inches of matrix from the side, they hoped that the petrified ribs would be able to be seen. These ribs were fragmented due to weathering since they were so near the surface. But due to their slant, the soil around them had held them in place. Very carefully, assisted by Delavar, who had accompanied Ron since March of 1985 as his taxi driver, began to scrape. They realized they had to be extremely careful to remove only a very few inches. Okay, what we plan to do here is to shave the rib timber part of this uh, section of the hull and of course the texture between the rib timbers and the material that has covered the boat are different in color and uh, of course in density and that sort of thing and so we uh, are going to be able to show the dimensions of the timbers here by doing it this way. Okay, again we're focusing in on the timbers in the side of the boat. And in particular I would like to make note of this large colorful one right here. Now that's a large uh, timber that was a part of the Keelson system that's 
protected the outside of the boat from boulders and logs and other debris that it would be forced against in the storm. And then Okay, Richard is okay. pointing to a stone right in the middle of the big Kilson configuration that comes around from the end. And if you'll notice the color difference there, that's where the Kilson comes around and goes up over the end of the boat. Also, if you'll notice at the top, there's a difference in the color up there. And we'll shave this off here in a moment and let you see what we're talking about. Okay, now to uh, help you visualize the keelson, external keelson that is on the model of the boat, we've strung this rope along here. Now, if we shave this off, it'll probably uh, speed up the erosion process but that rope is right along the bottom of the external keelson and if you'll notice there's about a three foot width of darker material right there just above the rope until you get to this area and then it widens out and uh, so the keelson was a little narrower up at the front of the boat than it was along the side of the boat. Okay, go ahead. Now you'll observe that that structural material, because it's petrified wood, is more porous and the water soaks into it and then in the winter when it freezes, this uh, the water expands when it becomes ice and fractures that material. So the petrified wood is much more vulnerable to the freezing and thawing that takes place in the winter time than the matrix are the cover material and so that's why they are a different color a different texture and also a different uh, in hardness alrighty that keelson comes right down through there and again we'll sweep along okay that's got it Richard sweep right down along through here this was a perfect example of how extremely fragile the remains were once exposed to the elements any intact structures would be reduced to tiny fragments in probably one season. If it was ever to be excavated, it would have to be first covered and protected, and then each exposed structure member would have to be encased in some type of acrylic polymer to seal it and protect it, a process that would involve a tremendous amount of time and effort. Yet Ron still dreamed of the day it could be excavated. In 1991, Ron took a tour group to the site, and as he approached, he noticed a large object and picked it up. When he turned it over in his hand, he saw that it displayed the perfect shape of a rivet with a washer around it, and that it appeared to be fossilized. Our last trip out there this past June, we found this very impressive rivet. And if you'll notice here, the plate itself is just a little more than a quarter of an inch in thickness. It's approximately three and a half inches in diameter, the plate itself, 
and then the shaft of the rivet is a roughly an inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter. And if you'll notice here, it was struck while it was hot and flared out the end of the shaft so that it would not slide back through the hole in this washer. And this uh, shows that their abilities to use metal uh, was quite advanced. In 1984, he had photographed areas along the sides of the arc which showed colorations suggestive of metal oxides, all in circles. He hadn't disturbed these for fear of destroying them, but now he believed this specimen showed an actual example of one of the metal fittings. It was analyzed by three separate laboratories. Since it was fossilized, a great deal of its original material would have been replaced by minerals, and the analysis showed it contained about 20% silicon, which was expected. However, it also contained very high percentages of aluminum, titanium, and iron, the same metals which were found in the slag material used as ballast, except for one major exception. The ballast material contained over 84% manganese, yet the rivet specimen only contained less than 1%. This was even more evidence. In the production of aluminum and steel, very large quantities of manganese are required, but very little remains in the alloy. Steel generally contains less than 1%, yet over 95% of the manganese produced today is used in the production of alloys, with the majority of it ending up in the waste product. And this is exactly what the evidence at Noah's Ark indicates. A few months later, in August of 1991, Ron, Richard Reeves, Marv Wilson, and Dr. Alan Roberts of Australia met with several authorities in Ankara to request a permit to excavate. Dr. Roberts had contacted Ron in 1990 and expressed a serious interest in the site. Ron had provided him with details of the research, which Dr. Roberts studied carefully. He visited the site alone in 1990 and, like Dr. Shea, believed that an excavation was necessary. By this time, he had received a financial commitment from a British corporation to fund the excavation with Ron as head of the project. Ron explained the procedure he planned to use that would protect the exposed sections. After short deliberations, the men were told that they would receive the permit. But it was Thursday, and due to a long holiday, the offices would not again be opened until Monday, at which time they were to pick up the permit. With several days to kill, the four men decided to fly to Erzurum and visit the region southwest of the Ark. DeLavar got a minivan and they headed south. But as they neared Bengal, they were taken hostage by a group of guerrillas belonging to the PKK, an outlaw Kurdish party. For three weeks, they were taken through the steep mountains, sleeping on the bare ground during the day and traveling constantly during the night. When it was over, any hopes of excavating were shattered. The men had been through a terrible ordeal, as we see them here in the helicopter which took them from Bengal. It was also too late in the season to consider excavating. Each family had to deal with the emotional trauma which only time would heal. In time, we all recovered. But the region continued to remain unstable. In June of 1992, we took our second tour group to Turkey, and as we neared Dobiasit, a beautiful rainbow appeared across the sky. The bus pulled over, and everyone got out to film and photograph it. Then we again continued down the road, but within a few minutes we were flagged down by soldiers who wouldn't allow us to visit the Ark. And to this day, the region remains unstable and dangerous for tourists. The controversy continues to grow, even though the evidence is overwhelming. 
Some who were once ardent supporters and associates now deny the evidence. So, is it really the Ark? What we actually have found is physical evidence that this is a boat. Uh, whether or not it's Noah's Ark is up to the people that review the material. Uh, that's up to them to decide on that. My personal feeling is that it is Noah's Ark.